You're watching Helping Registrars Shine. Assessing and managing registrars with performance issues. Produced by GP Supervisors Australia and presented by Dr Simon Morgan. We would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which this recording was produced and pay our respects to their elders past, present, future and their families. It's a great pleasure to be here and to talk to a topic which I must say has been very much part of my work over the last two decades and to give you some tips and tricks and a little bit of wisdom along the way. The fascinating thing about this topic, Simon, is often you think you know what the registrar is capable of, but it's not until something goes wrong that you have some sort of visibility to what they don't know. So it'll be interesting to hear your insights about that. It's a really good point you make right at the outset, Glenn, because in fact, I'm not sure whether the title is actually the best one in that we do want to assess and manage registrars with performance issues, but you've just made that very important point that sometimes we don't observe a performance issue, maybe until it's too late or maybe at all, and the registrar is actually struggling, they've got some issues, they're in difficulty, which is the other term we commonly use for this cohort of registrars. So we're talking about the registrar in difficulty or the registrar with performance issues. And you'll see a bit of a cat theme along the way here. This is a cat stuck up a tree. Um, I actually think I saw a fire brigade recently rescuing, I don't know if it was a cat, but an animal from a tree. So it still happens. But this cat's somewhat stuck high up in a tree. And this might be our registrar who's struggling. You all have a case study. You all could present something in this forum that illustrates some of the issues we're going to cover tonight. But this registrar was somebody I was looking after. She was an international medical graduate. She was in her 30s and she'd been working in the emergency department at one of the local hospitals for six or eight years prior to entering GP training. She was working part-time and she was actually deemed from her referees and others as a very capable emergency department registrar. She started general practice in a rural term, about an hour commute actually from a regional centre. And quite quickly, it appeared she was struggling. We were monitoring her performance in early weeks, but things blew up pretty rapidly when she left work one day very abruptly. And we had calls from, amongst others, the practice manager saying that she was grossly incompetent, which is a pretty strong observation to make about an early GPT-1. And the other issue was that her supervisor, who was very supportive was in a sense secondary to the practice principal who wasn't her supervisor he was supervising another doctor in the practice but this practice principal had really taken it on himself to be quite critical about her performance and she was blindsided by this it turned out and we'll come back to this registrar later but it turned out that she actually was in a sense a typical registrar absolutely struggling with anxiety and the uncertainty of general practice. And this was on a pre-morbid background of an anxiety disorder, which in hindsight, I'm pretty confident we hadn't picked up, we weren't aware of, and we certainly hadn't put into place some of the supports that might have been otherwise useful. So that's just a bit of a kind of case study to whet your appetite for the session. And it is at this point that I really want to make it clear that while international medical graduate registrars are overrepresented in the registrar in difficulty or the registrar with performance issues because of the nature of their background and their training and sometimes English is a second language and cultural barriers and communication issues, it is in no sense unique to this cohort of registrars. This webinar that we ran last year on supervising the international medical graduate GP registrar is, I think, a really useful parallel to what we'll be talking to, covering some of the preemptive things that we can do, certainly managing some of the issues as they arise. So let me refer you to that. And also just make the point that we do not uncommonly encounter registrars in difficulty coming from Australian universities. So in no sense wanting to single a particular group out. The learning objectives tonight we're going to be talking about the range of factors leading to registrars experiencing difficulties. So kind of what is in the background? What is the thing that leads registrars to struggle? And then I want to draw this really, what I think is a really wonderful parallel between your role as GP supervisors and your role 
as GPs, as clinicians, and how I can use the two in parallel to think about screening for issues, diagnosing the learner, and then, in fact, implementing learner-centred, bracket, patient-centred management strategies to assist registrars in difficulty. So that's what we'll be aiming to cover over the next 50 minutes or so. Now, I've run versions of this workshop with other groups, and one of the ideas that came from a medical educator at GP Synergy, Richard Griffiths, who I'm very happy to acknowledge as the genesis of this idea, was to draw the registrar in difficulty then maybe with a pen and paper, you can actually start to sketch out the registrar and difficulty. If you were to draw the registrar and difficulty, or indeed how you would imagine or how you've observed registrars in difficulty presenting, what are the things you've seen? What are the, the ways registrars present? To fuel your thoughts, this is one of the images, but of a registrar kind of looking a bit of anger, a bit of frustration, a bit of distress, certainly with a question mark, hands in the air, looking at the laptop, maybe some sheaf of patient records in front of them, waste paper bin full. And you can imagine adding a whole bunch of other extraneous things to that. This was just one of the images that we collected from this particular exercise. But I must say the best one, there was a supervisor who thought, no, I'm not going to draw this. I'm going to make it out of Play-Doh. But here it was, done live, in, this was the group in the Northern Territory. So this registrar sort of looking fairly distressed, head in their hands, slumped over, and then, you know, to the point of actually sort of collapsing onto the floor, which I think is a wonderful representation of what we're dealing with today. Now, clearly, we're wanting to get in well before the image on the left and well, well before the image on the right. But this is sometimes how our registrars present, and indeed the registrar I talked to at the beginning. So I talked about this sort of parallel between clinical and educational assessment and management. This is maybe something you've come across and maybe something you actually practice, but if it's not, let me infuse you to think about it in your joint role as clinicians and GP supervisors as educators. So we can think about the registrar in difficulty as having things in the background, risks and potential causes as to why they may present like they do. We can think about things that we can do as educators and supervisors, how we can put things into place to prevent issues arising, how do we screen registrars, and how do we identify issues early. We then need to think about diagnosing the learner. What tools can we use to investigate a registrar that's struggling? And indeed, what is the diagnosis? What is the, the root cause? leading, of course, to an effective management plan, and just as we do in clinical practice, follow-up and safety netting. So again, if that's not a model that you've used before, really encourage you to think about that in your role as supervisors, because it's something we do every day as GPs, and we can apply those sort of skills and analysis to our role as educators. So I'll start with the first bit, risk factors and etiology. So what are the risk factors? What are the underlying causes of the registrar and difficulty? And again, Glenn, you field multiple questions from supervisors and have a real sense of what the issues are for our members. What do you think they're observing in their registrars? Well, it's interesting because I see this quite regularly as well come across my desk, which is previous bad terms. So previous bad experiences that then lead them to see things a certain way or be stressed by it, pre-morbid history of anxiety or depression, registrars coming into GPT-1 not really interested in the program, and external stresses. So we see that, and we certainly educate on that in particular, uh, about registrars being stressed about potentially moving house, potentially moving state, potentially moving workplaces, all in the same fortnight type time frame. So we've got high achievers here. We've got poor previous performance in junior terms, often hidden, so promoted out of their supervisor's way, feeling overwhelmed in general practice, going that it's going to be too hard, social issues, which would come from moving into a new workplace, new colleagues, potentially a new town, that sort of thing. Personal circumstances, we see that also, whether it's people that are having a baby or having relationship breakups and different things like that, people with difficulties in their home life, experienced registrars, long hospital and overseas experience and not engaged in the program. Yeah. Certainly a very wide, diverse range of issues that can underpin this. Can I 
make my first plug, and that is this guide published by HETI, which is the Health Education and Training Institute, which is essentially the organisation that looks after pre-vocational doctors in New South Wales. There's probably an equivalent in all states. Being based in New South Wales, this is the one at least I'm semi-familiar with. Yes, it's hospital-based, but it's actually an incredible readable resource that I would point you to, or maybe your state-based equivalent, to think about some of these issues. The other resource I will plug very strongly is the GPSA Guide to Managing the Registrar and Difficulty. So they're, I guess, the two go-to guides, resources, sets of guidelines that you might want to access in an ongoing way. So they talk about some of the things Glenn's spoken to, work and home issues, health issues, clinical knowledge and skills, and behaviour, though I must say I'm not overly comfortable with the term behaviour. I think that's much more attitudes, personality, the registrar's the way they see the world, I think. So this is a very long list and really suffice to say that there's multiple, multiple potential issues, clearly. But some of the big ones, and I guess some of the ones we focus on moving down from the top left, is issues with reasoning. So we see knowledge gaps, but the reasoning issues and being able to synthesise and integrate and put the material together is an issue. Communication commonly. Health issues, and these can be buried and can be hidden. And really, without asking, without raising this, we may not be aware of chronic disease or significant medical issues, certainly mental health issues, alcohol and substance use, those sorts of things. And so the nature of the registrar, their perfectionism, their self-confidence, their lack of motivation. And then there's a whole range of environmental things that, again, we don't need to go through, but that nature of transition from the hospital to the general practice environment. And of course, this is a hospital-based resource, so it doesn't talk to that as much, but alludes to some of those things. And certainly the other facet of that is relocation and family issues and home-based concerns. I guess it's just worth always reflecting on the breadth of these issues when we're thinking about a registrar who's struggling. So a bit more focused on general practice. And I really, really like this list because I think I've been a GP for 20 years and it's a very, very long time since I moved from the hospital into general practice. General practice is now a place of great familiarity and comfort to me. But for our registrars, we have to keep reminding ourselves that it is an extraordinarily overwhelming environment. Everything, everything is different from the types of patients they're seeing to the time they have with their patients, to the systems, to their independence. Suddenly they're consulting with patients behind the closed doors. And I think we just have to keep reminding ourselves this is an extraordinarily challenging time, even for a well-adjusted, clinically sound, secure registrar, these will be challenges. If any of those other things are precarious, then clearly the house of cards may topple. And of course, I put telehealth at the end there because that's been the world that we've lived in for the last couple of years too. And maybe that's just a better pictorial representation of general practice. It's been described as a swamp and general practitioners as swamp warriors. And essentially we get muddy and we slide our way through the murk. Unlike our hospital colleagues who are kind of on the high, hard ground looking down at us where they've got access to investigations and things to clear themselves a bit more readily and we're dealt with dealing with the uncertainty. So just to think, what are the risk factors? What's the etiology? What's the breadth of causes that may actually impact on my registrar? The next aspect of this is around prevention and screening and early identification. And again, thinking about parallels here, we've got a patient that's 50 and well and not presenting with a particular problem, just like our new GPT-1 who's happy and feeling good about things, what screening can we or should we do to try to pick up an issue before it arises? How do we identify these things early? What preventative strategies can we use? And before I ask those questions of you, I just, I'm a bit of a pedant. And so when I hear colleagues saying, I've screened them for celiac disease, and I think, well, no, you haven't actually. The presented with diarrhea, your case finding. Screening, technically, is the examination of people who are asymptomatic. I'm not in any sense suggesting you pull them up, because I don't either. But when I hear that we're screening people for a brain tumour because they're presented with a headache, well, we're not. We're case finding or investigating them. So there is a difference between the two. 
And when I'm talking about screening the otherwise undifferentiated registrar, it's very much they're asymptomatic. They're not presenting with an issue as opposed to case finding or saying, yeah, there's a bit of an issue here. How might we look into that a little bit further? And this is just a bit of light lightness. And I do lots and lots of talks on test ordering and screening. And this is just a bit of a plug for the importance of mammograms. But back to our talk, prevention is better than cure. What screening tools can we use? And again, to put it into context, this is these are registrars who are not presenting with an issue. They're just maybe arriving to your practice early on as GPT-1s or 2s, no identified concerns. And what primary prevention interventions can we implement? What can we actually do to kind of smooth the way, to make it less likely that we're going to be ending up with the cat stuck up a tree and needing to call the fire brigade to get them out? We've got random case analyses. That's if they're not glossing things over. Yep. Open-ended questioning, direct observation, daily chat, build rapport with the registrar, orientation, openness and good communication. Perfect, perfect. Take them out for coffee or lunch and have a general chat. Perfect. Debriefing after sessions. Yep. There's loads of ideas here. Clinical notes so, review. So you're probably thinking, yeah, this is kind of commonsensical and things. But again, I'm just wanting you to think about in that kind of clinical way. These are things we can actually intervene with and we can separate the screening from the prevention. And these are things that the regional training organisations may implement, certainly things that you may wish to do in the practice setting or a bit of both. So clinical checklists, and these are just some examples, there's many more, but sometimes the, the RTOs, your host organisations, will actually get your registrars to do a quiz, a 50 or 100 item clinical quiz. And if you can avail yourselves of the results and get a sense of how they're going, that can be really useful. Again, the undifferentiated registrar, oh, gee, they've scored pretty poorly in that. I had no idea the clinical knowledge might be so poor. But the clinical checklist might be just, here's a long list of clinical presentations. Rate yourself on your confidence or perceived competence in managing a whole range of things. We talked about direct observation and RCA. So those sort of formative assessment tools, which clearly also fall into the domain of investigations. Just like mammography, we do as a screening tool. We'll do mammography for somebody who's got a breast lump. But these formative assessment tools, again, which we push so hard, early direct observation, early random case analysis, you know, an early sense of how the registrar is performing. And I've written just ask, but I think the other response was probably better take them out for coffee. And in taking them out for coffee, sure, enjoy the coffee, but just go through some of these things casually but possibly a bit methodically just to get a sense of these background things this will make a difference to i think heading off potential issues as they arise so the registrar's background and experience perhaps more so for an international medical graduate teaching and learning and that does include as we've heard around their previous terms and their previous experience of their training i think it's absolutely fair game for a supervisor to sensitively ask about health issues and well-being and anything that may impact on their training clearly allowing the registrar to maintain confidentiality if they wish but those sorts of things again may make a big difference if it's not raised maybe they won't speak to the fact as my case study did that they've got a history of anxiety or indeed they've got Crohn's disease and you know it flares regularly and they may need time off or there might be issues with that family and home life I find the whole area around managing uncertainty so so fascinating but I still think we're probably quite poor as a group around sitting down with a registrar and saying, how do you go when somebody comes in and you have no idea what's going on? And if you ask that question and they say, you know what, it's terrifying, then it is such a powerful tool to then think about, well, what strategies can I implement? And that we're not talking about managing uncertainty to any degree here, except I can point to the webinar that we also ran on that last year. So there's some of the tools a bit more specific and a little bit more structured in the GPSA supervising the international medical graduate GP registrar guide. There are two assessment tools. One is a self-assessment tool for the registrar. The other is a supervisor assessment tool. These are written for the IMG, but with a little bit of poetic license, they're absolutely applicable to every registrar because they cover these core issues around communication and clinical skills and consultation skills and past teaching learning and personal issues and professionalism and all those sorts of things 
So that's a really useful tool, which will cover lots of the just asks from the previous slide. Preventative strategies. I know we all do this, but to think about it in its breadth. So orientation, and that's not just this is the defibrillator and this is the pathology paper for the local provider and some of the clinical stuff, and this is the practice manager and this is the reception staff. Again, we ran a webinar last year on professionalism around an orientation to professionalism. What does professionalism look like in my practice? How do I expect you to behave professionally in general practice or more specifically in my practice? So I think that is often not part of a comprehensive orientation. And of course, so importantly, and those rural GP supervisors who are listening in will know of the importance of an orientation that includes the family, especially when uh, there's been relocation. The second thing is a so-called supervision and teaching plan. And I know some of the RTOs do this well, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't apply it if your RTO isn't doing it. And this is really just gathering some of these particular issues around supervision and teaching. Primary prevention. This is sitting down with your registrar and saying, I'm going to do this so we don't run a cropper. And that includes ad hoc supervision. How do I get called? What's my availability? What's the mechanism actually calling for help? When do we do formal teaching? What's a program look like? What are your educational needs? And again, so much of this and these basic things we covered in the new supervisor webinar series last year. So you can expand your knowledge as you need on these things, but around formal teaching. What's the mechanism? How are we going to do performance appraisal and feedback? And I really like this term supervision meetings. If you're a PhD candidate or a postdoc, you have supervision meetings with your supervisor. I actually would really like that language brought maybe into um, GP training a little more that these are formal supervision meetings. How are you going? You know, what are the issues? How can we address some of these things in that very formal way, as well as all the informal ad hoc meetings that occur? And the last of my not exhaustive list of primary prevention strategies is this so-called calling for help list. And that, if you're not aware of it, is a wonderful paper that was published a couple of years ago now by Jared Ingham. And it's a great list of essentially high risk presentations that can be incredibly useful to run through with a registrar or for a registrar to self-assess on. Again, not knowing there's an issue, no presentation of issue, but potentially as a preventative strategy so that the registrars are not coming a proper later in the piece. So, Glenn, any observations, comments at this point up till now? I think definitely reiterating on the, the discussion around professionalism and expectations, one of the things that, that I observe is the assumptions that we make, that we share common understandings of what is professionalism. But if you consider and sit around a, a table with people and ask them what professionalism is, often the answers that they will give you are observations of what is not professional without defining exactly what you expect to see when they rock up to work. And we have registrars that come from far-flung places where their attire would be very appropriate for the locations that they've come from. They're coming into a completely potentially new country, certainly a new practice, certainly new new work environment and in lots of respects general practice is as much about unlearning what they've learned from previous environments and so it's important to set those really firm expectations boundaries and establish good supervision. Thanks Glenn and I guess as you reinforce that point because often when we think about the registrar and difficulty we're thinking of somebody struggling with anxiety and uncertainty, maybe somebody who's got really poor clinical knowledge and reasoning, maybe somebody who's depressed or really anxious or has been relocated from their home town to a rural environment and is struggling. I mean, there's lots and lots of things. But so often we see professionalism issues as the way registrars present. Again, there may be a whole lot of things behind that, but it's such an important point to reinforce. So. Again, just like we would in clinical practice, there's a bunch of stuff that's in the background of a presenting illness. We can do things, hopefully, to try to minimise the likelihood of a patient presenting or developing 
an issue by appropriate screening and early identification and putting some primary preventative strategies in. But of course, patients present. They present with clinical features as registrars present with a whole range of issues. And it's our job as educational diagnosticians and managers to investigate, to work out what's going on. And very often we are referring to specialists, bracket the medical educators at the local RTO or other support mechanisms to make some kind of diagnosis. And just like in general practice, where the diagnosis is sometimes not apparent or commonly not apparent, you know, it may be difficult to, to actually put our finger on it. Sorry, there's a really good comment here about the main thing is address anything early and don't let it fester. Now, part of that is making sure that you capture it early enough. And part of cap- capturing it early enough is either seeing it yourself and the registrar may or may not recognise it to be able to articulate it. But it's incredible if you sit down for a cup of coffee with an employee and chew the fat, as it were, how things come up and how things reveal themselves. So it's important to provide those opportunities as regularly as you possibly can. Ask open questions, but pointed questions as well. We'll elicit the responses that are going to be useful. And you, I think, did mention rapport. And again, the the parallels between being a clinician and being an educator or being a supervisor are so strong. A registrar will tell you a whole bunch of stuff when they have a level of rapport and and comfort and and trust with you, just like a patient will. And that doesn't mean that you're going to like every registrar and you're going to have a relationship with every every registrar, just like with patients, but it's something to aspire to. So I'll move into this, the realm now of the registrar presenting with an issue, because this is how they present. This is the sorts of things that they manifest and we observe. So again, looking at the HETI guide and just sort of thinking about it, it's again, a long list. The main thing, I guess, and the title of this talk is around performance. So issues with the way they work. And they may be some of the things there around professional things like being late or absent or having issues with the way they deal with staff. But they may be on the other end of the continuum where they're overworking. They're working back late in the evening to get their notes done. They're failing to call for help, all those sorts of things. There might be overt health concerns and observations around how they're functioning there may be complaints i think is another way we often see so again there's a whole range of ways registrars present just like you may say what are the 20 common presentations in general practice we could probably list the four or five most common presentations for the registrar in difficulty although there are many 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 variations of that as you'd be aware and you may all know uncertain Bertrand you may all have looked after him or guys of him over your time as supervisors he's GPT2 UK trained and he did physician training for five years prior to entering the GP training program he's regularly running an hour late you know halfway through a session he's already an hour late and he appears to be seeking help appropriately but really when you drill down and you think about when you're Get a registrar asking for assistance. Always ask yourself, what's this registrar wanting? Are they seeking uh, assistance? Are they seeking reassurance? Or are they actually drowning? So getting a sense of what actually is the motivation for them to ask questions. And in this case, he's really constantly seeking reassurance. He's doing a fine job. He's pretty slow on it, but he's okay. And he's just worried about missing something. So again, a typical kind of physician-trained maybe overcomprehensive GP registrar, as opposed to Cocky Locky, who's a new GPT-1. He's been in the ED department, unlike my registrar, who was struggling, but he is, he's done a bunch of locums. And man, general practice, I don't know what everyone's saying. This is, this is a doddle, you know. Uh, he bangs through his consultations. His notes are brief. He's had a couple of complaints that he just doesn't listen. And really, general practice is a breeze. I mean, I don't know what all the fuss is about, you know. In and out, it's all good. And maybe you sit in or maybe there's a sense of from the teaching visits that he's really just skimming the surface. He's just, you know, not delving in or not allowing the patient to actually even get to the depth of the problem. 
Shaipalai is another registrar. She's a GPT-3. She was born and trained in India and she worked over in her home country as an ONG consultant. Again, we've all seen Palai and the type of registrar she is. She's a very lovely, respectful woman. She's a mother of a few kids, but she's introspective. She's very underconfident. She's got clinical knowledge gaps, significant knowledge gaps, reflecting her long experience in a sort of narrow discipline. And the patient's feedback is of her being lovely, but really pretty hard to understand. I mean, she seems really sweet, and but I just didn't quite get what she was saying. And then there's Rude Jude. Rude Jude, she's a GPT-2. She's been around the hospital system for about four years, Australian trained. And she's just one of those prickly characters. She's late to work. She's a bit sharp with the reception staff. It's all a bit of an effort to return phone calls to patients. And the practice nurses really don't like calling her for those quick prolia or B12 injections because she's just so dismissive. So again, you can see even with poor registrars, there's multiple ways they can present and, and sort of facets and thinking about their background and how they might look. And we'll come back to these registrars later in the piece. So what can we do? What investigations can we use when we think about diagnosing the issues behind these people? Well, we've had a, an observation from a couple of people about video observations. Yep. So somebody said they can't reiterate how much video and the opportunity for registrars to see themselves as a great learning tool <laughs> and rightly pointed out, probably not a bad idea for us supervisors to video ourselves as well to observe how well we do. I think uh, excellent observations. As I alluded to earlier, when we think about screening tools and screening tests, as we do in clinical practice, they're commonly the same. Oh, now this is just a slight aside. So I talk a lot about over-testing, doing too many tests on people. This is actually something slightly different. This is over-enthusiastic testing. And this was a case report that was in the MJ, I think probably 18 months ago now, of remember when they used to swab the PCR test and it really, really was, I think they got a bit of brain. Well, for this poor patient, they did. And then in fact, caused a CSF leak. I'm sure it's happened multiple times around the world, certainly in the early days of pretty aggressive nasal swabbing. So that's over enthusiastic testing. But what testing can we do? We've talked about those sort of case discussions and observation of the registrar's practice, clearly all those formative assessment tools that we like to use. I think simulated patients and I know here at GPSA, we do like the notion of role play and being able to say, instead of sitting in with a registrar for three or four patients and seeing some pretty dry stuff coming through, you can role play some really rich stuff and you can really target that to your registrar in terms of trying to work out exactly what the issues are. Now, clearly a rude Jude or a cocky locky well, a cocky locky may actually remain fairly superficial, but we know there's a Hawthorne effect and people practice differently when we know they're being observed. But simulated patients can be powerful, as can 360-degree appraisal, which, again, you don't need to rely on your RTO to encourage registrars to do. You can do it informally or semi-formally in your own practice. And I know ACRAM do this by way of routine and some of the RTOs do as well, but if it's not being done and you'd like to do it, this is objective evidence. This is an investigation. This is a, a tool that we can use when we're helping to diagnose the learner. And not wanting to make this educational clinical parallel too close, but there's John Murtagh, the developer of this internationally regarded diagnostic model of prompt. I think this is a wonderful model to use clinically, but I really like its consideration of use in an educational format. So yes, absolutely. We could probably label Bertrand and Lockie and Pillai and Jude and make a diagnosis, but Jude's arrogant. Lockie's just thinks it's too easy because he's been in ED for a while and he's not bothering going, getting the depth. Pillai, she's got some cultural issues and she's got clinical noise gaps. They're the probability of diagnosis, absolutely. But we also need to think of the often mists and the masquerades and maybe even what the person's telling me or the registrar's telling me in my interactions with them. So again, maybe it's a stretch, maybe not. Maybe some of you would might like to consider this model. I've got this registrar. It's pretty apparent what's going on, but hang on. Am I not thinking of some of the diagnoses, some of the issues? Am I not thinking of the potential alcohol abuse or the mental health issues or the domestic violence 
or the other issues that may be there. I think it may have some merit. You may not think so, but I think I quite like that as a theme. I didn't overlook red flags deliberately because I think red flags are important when we're assessing the registrar in difficulty. What would you see as a red flag? Like this is big, this is worry, worry, worry. So red flag, I'm going to say exhaustive patient notes. Yep. Exhaustive testing, which kind of indicates that they really and not using clinical reasoning, they're just yep. using a scattergun approach and seeing what they land. I think <laughs> it's not just a nicety that we make observations about registrars testing. It absolutely can indicate how well they're performing and their reasoning and how much they're struggling. We've got really long consults all the yeah, time. Yeah. They're taking way too long. We've got patients complaining to staff often, staying excessively late after work, unconsciously incompetent, sending everyone for tests. A silence, no questions. I think that's definitely concerning when you have a registrar that is not asking anything. You wanting to be certain that they're truly okay in there. Yeah. Yelling coming from the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. So the Hetty guide, I mean, they list three. These are clearly barn door red flags. If a patient's injured, and patients get injured and things happen, but if there's a patient safety incident or a big near miss, that may be absolutely just one of those things but it may be oh dear i've really got to think about is there an issue with my registrar clearly trainee safety and allegations of criminal conduct professional misconduct i mean they're big picture stuff i worked as a locum years ago now in a practice in the west of sydney and after the couple of weeks i said to the practice manager i know thank you very much she said you've been great you know i said oh thanks have i i mean you know i just did my job she said yeah no no she said the previous guy, we'd come in and we'd clean his room after the session. There'd be beer cans in his waste paper bin. And I, thought, I thought, well, there's a red flag if I've ever heard one. So now I know these are really pretty gross, but the ones that Glenn listed, I think are really good and important and obviously grades of that, which mean we have to intervene. Like a red flag of significant weight loss or night sweats or bone pain, we have to go, well, everything else looks good, but no, I've got, to, I've got to look into this harder. The other thing is around severity. And it is important to get a sense of how severe the problem is because that may impact on how urgently we need to intervene, how much we may need to get external advice and how well we document. I probably should have said at the outset that very much what I'm endeavouring to do here is to give you a sort of general overview of this topic Because as hopefully you've seen with the four registrars I presented, every single case is really very, very different. And it's actually very difficult to apply broad general rules to managing the registrar with anxiety or the registrar managing uncertainty and finding that difficult or the registrar who's depressed or the registrar with clinical reasoning gaps. And in fact, I'd be sending off on a whole range of different resources and things. So this is very much a kind of assessment and management strategy more broadly. And hopefully I have also encouraged you to avail yourselves of some of the resources that you can then, as you get closer to a diagnosis or closer to a sense of what's going on, you can actually apply some of the things. And again, to reinforce, we covered lots of that last year in the, in the webinar series around reasoning and professionalism and calling for help and all those sorts of things. So have a look at some of those resources. But we finish with our job as GPs, our job as educators and supervisors, and that's a plan of management and ongoing review. And I really like the notion of when we manage uncertainty in general practice clinically, it actually doesn't really matter if we don't know what's going on. We can convey that to the patient to some degree, but if the plan, if there's certainty around what the plan is, then the patient will respond to that and we can go and sleep sound at night. And that often is the case in education and in supervision as well. So Hetty talks about the principles of management. Patient safety is the primary consideration. This comes from the hospital system, but I think absolute resonates with us in general practice, that trainees require supervision and support. And they push this notion of prevention, early recognition and early intervention is preferred over running into problems and being punitive down the track. And one of the supervisors made that observation, Glenn, around whatever it is, hear it, respond to it, get in early. 
I've been now pointing you to the GPSA guide because it's actually very, very good and sets out very nicely how we should approach this. And again, I'm talking in generalities here, but you know, we need to make this assessment just like in a clinical setting, we need to fairly exhaustively investigate to have sufficient information to make a plan. And that might be speaking to a range of people, certainly with the registrar and with the registrar early, but other people that are involved. Investigation we've talked about, referral, and I think involving the experts, involving the specialists, the consultants or the educators early is really important. And this is the bit that I think who likes filling in forms? I just about died this afternoon after my seventh. Can you just fill this form in? But I do think, and I would encourage us, and the RTOs actually push this reasonably hard about action plans. I just think like an asthma action plan, it's documented, it's written, it's something that you can look at and adhere to. And I think an action plan, even if it's brief, is really, really useful. We will meet on this time. You will aim to implement these things. We'll do these observations. I'd like you to read and to confirm you've done these things by this date. Implement the plan and review. And so this is just a snip from the GPSA guide, which again, is freely available on our website. Confidentiality is important. Gathering information that I've just talked about and triangulating that and getting a sense of it as we do in clinical practice. I think we just have to default, even if there's been issues around professionalism or lack of courtesy or those sorts of things, it may well be a manifestation of the registrar struggling in other areas. And I think the default to providing support to the registrar is so important. Yes, they may need disciplining. Absolutely, I'm not saying that that's not an outcome, but I think if we default to saying there may be something behind all this is so important in documentation. So Hattie talks in some depth around some of these issues. And again, I'm just going to touch on them as we finish. So clinical performance issues. And again, so much of this, the MEs at the RTOs will be helping support you to do. So how do we support registrars, clinical development, study skills, simulated patients, clinical exposure, remediation, those sorts of things. How do we shift a registrar's attitudes and behaviour? It was mentioned about video, and I think that's an incredibly powerful tool. And sometimes even formal psychology I've observed for those more difficult registrars. Health, I'm making sure registrars are seeing their GP and having appropriate care. And the other end of the scale, whether we need to consider mandatory reporting for the registrars that may be not functioning, that's another talk in itself. And family support for the work and home things. And again, this is very brief, but I'm just encouraging you to think about these broadly and have a look at this guide in terms of some of the specifics. It takes a huge amount of time to document how often are these strategies successful. And I'd like to talk to that. From the perspective of supervision, if you don't establish regular expected strategies and interventions, then when you have a massive problem, and you have to document, it takes the employee by surprise. It looks more punitive than what it actually is. And they don't become used to the documentation of their performance. So it's really important to establish those performance mechanisms as just part of the course. And you can engage your registrar. Your registrar can be part of the documentation process. They can do the scribing if it needs to be a shared process but it absolutely needs to be documented. I can only reinforce that. And it speaks to the need to document things like a supervision and teaching plan and documenting maybe some of those early preventative things that I talked about coming from the IMG guide around some of those potential issues. As you say, it sets up expectations. It means it's written. It means it's more likely to occur. And I absolutely understand it's onerous potentially, but... This doesn't happen with every registrar, clearly. And once we are dealing with somebody who's really struggling, it's going to make for a much more successful intervention. There's my registrar up a tree. She had a very successful resolution, really, after a pretty torturous and difficult period at the practice. It basically turned out she was struggling. She was extremely anxious. She was really not coping, as in she was barely getting to work, faced with uncertainty, faced with the scope of practice. She was running late. And that had not been observed, but it also led to interpersonal difficulties. She had a 
unfortunately a very unsupportive practice principal, a sort of co-supervisor, and it became a very difficult environment and such that she was actually taken out of the practice. But she, I don't know about flourished, but she has certainly found her feet in a much more supportive practice. And the interventions were very much around her mental health, which had been existing anyway, around anxiety management, so addressing the health issues. It was around educational support. It was around sort of structural things in terms of the patients she saw and the time she had. And it was a, actually a very good outcome. I think what it led me to reflect on was that we probably didn't put those preventative and screening strategies into place sufficiently well. There's always scope, I think, to do those things better. Thanks all. Great to have you on board and we look forward to seeing you at an upcoming event very soon. Please have a look at uh, all those resources on our website and happy supervising. Thanks for watching. We'd love your feedback. Please comment or subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates on new videos. If you'd like to ask a question or suggest a topic, you can contact us via our website at gpsa.org.au. GP Supervisors Australia is supported by funding from the Australian Government under the Australian General Practice Training Program.